Hello, I'm Erin Riggs, a genetic counselor at Geisinger Health System and project coordinator for the ClinGen resource. In this webinar, we will discuss one of ClinGen's resources, our dosage sensitivity map. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to describe the history of the project. Um, ClinGen actually got its start in a different project, um, first launched in 2007, called the International Standard for Cytogenomic Arrays Consortium, or ISCA. This group focused on standardization of test design and interpretation as it related to cytogenomic microarrays. Realizing that these issues were not unique to structural variants, in 2012, we expanded to include the sequence variant community and subsequently changed our name to the more inclusive International Collaboration for Clinical Genomics. In 2013, we expanded yet again, and the investigators that were a part of ICCG became partners in the ClinGen resource with the goal of creating a centralized repository of interconnected resources of clinically annotated genes and variants to improve our understanding of genomic variation and optimize its use in genomic medicine. Through the ClinGen resource, our partners, which include patients, clinicians, laboratories, and researchers, are able to share genetic and health data through publicly available portals, such as NCBI's ClinVar or our patient registry, Genome Connect. This information is used to answer a number of critical curation questions. For example, is this gene associated with a disease or assessing clinical validity? Is this variant causative? assessing pathogenicity, and is this information actionable or assessing clinical utility? All of this information contributes to our collective genomic knowledge base, and this information is publicly available and can be used to improve patient care through genomic medicine. Specifically for the cytogenomic community, ClinGen provides the following resources. We have publicly available data from contributing cytogenomic laboratories, which is displayed in various NCBI resources, including ClinVar. If you're interested in that, that will be the subject of a separate webinar, and you can look for it on clinicalgenome.org. We also provide evidence-based reviews of dosage sensitivity. And by dosage sensitivity, we are referring specifically to haploinsufficiency and triplosensitivity. By haploinsufficiency, we mean if this gene or genomic region was lost or deleted, would it result in a particular phenotype? And by triplosensitivity, we mean if there were an extra copy of this gene or genomic region, would it result in a specific phenotype? This will be the subject of our webinar today. Why do we need a resource like this? Some copy number variants, or CMVs, are recurrent and are well described in the literature. This includes CMVs uh, mediated by segmental duplication, such as the 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. But other CMVs are unique and not as well described in the literature. So when you need to interpret CMVs like th these, what you often need to do is assess the genomic content of that CMV and correlate it with established clinical literature. We began work on our dosage sensitivity map in 2011 in an effort to assist laboratories in their evaluations of this genomic content. And by making such a tool publicly available, we also hope to promote consistency between laboratory interpretation. How do we do this? Well, for each individual gene or genomic region that we review, we search the literature for evidence supporting or refuting dosage sensitivity as a mechanism for any disease associated with that gene. We ask ourselves the following question. Is this genomic region associated with a clinical phenotype? Is this phenotype associated with dosage sensitivity? How many lines of evidence are there supporting dosage sensitivity? Are CMVs involved in this genomic region enriched in disease populations? And is there any compelling evidence to refute dosage sensitivity? Evidence for haploinsufficiency and triplosensitivity are considered separately for each gene and genomic region. And each one is given both a haploinsufficiency and a triplosensitivity score, meant to signify the strength of the available evidence for each. Our highest score is three, and genes and regions assigned to score three are considered to have sufficient evidence for haploinsufficiency and or triplosensitivity. Copy number variants or CMVs involving these regions could be considered pathogenic in a clinical setting. 
decreasing scores signify decreasing evidence supporting haploinsufficiency or triplet sensitivity. A score of zero means that there is no evidence, while a score of dosage sensitivity unlikely indicates that there is evidence contradicting the role of dosage sensitivity in disease. The criteria for all the scores is published in the reference below if you'd like to take a closer look. When considering evidence for haploinsufficiency and triplosensitivity scores for this project, our primary evidence is case data from humans. For haploinsufficiency, we're specifically looking for evidence of loss of function, including single gene deletions, exonic deletions within a single gene, nonsense sequence variants undergoing nonsense mediated decay, and we will consider other sequence variants if there is strong functional evidence suggesting loss of function. For triplosensitivity, we're really considering whole gene duplications only. We do not consider dupli intragenic duplications evidence for the triplosensitivity score. As you use our dosage sensitivity map, keep the following in mind. In general, we're taking a conservative approach when we score each gene and genomic region. For gene evaluations, only evidence involving that gene alone is considered. The following are typically considered supporting evidence, but not primary. And I want to reiterate that these data are still useful pieces of information, and they are noted in the gene record, but they don't contribute to the overall score, such as smallest region of overlap, um, evidence from animal models, unpublished evidence, or evidence from translocation cases unless both breakpoints have been mapped. Additionally, please note that each entry is reviewed by either two independent reviewers or the entire committee. This information should be used to augment your own review of the evidence, but not as a substitute for your own review. And certainly, if you're looking at a resource and you feel that something we've posted is incorrect, please tell us, and what I've highlighted here is a place on our website where you can click to easily contact us. This is a view of the website, and you'll see the web address up top where you can find this information, again, publicly available. Um, it's also updated on real time, in real time at this particular site. When you'd like to search on this site, you can search by either gene name or by location using genomic coordinates. Once you search for something, you'll receive results that look like this. Please note that this is displayed in two tabs. By default, the first tab that you will see will be individual genes that overlap the coordinates you provide or that match the gene name that you provide. Um, you'll notice that there are several columns here, and you can click on any of these columns to sort the table by that particular piece of information. You'll also note that some genes are noted as awaiting review and others are marked as complete. And only those that are marked as complete have been reviewed by the committee and officially closed out. And finally, if you were to click on that second tab, region issues, if there's a number in parentheses there that indicates that there is a, a curated genomic region that overlaps the coordinates that you provided, so be sure to pay attention to that if it's relevant to you. Once you select the entry that you're interested in, you'll be taken to a page that looks like this, and this is the top of the page. Note that we do post the date that this gene or region was last evaluated. You want to pay attention to this because if it was, you know, some time ago, you'll definitely want to do your own literature evaluation to see what's been going on in the time since you've last looked at it. Um, you'll also be shown the haploinsufficiency and triplosensitivity scores right at the top for a quick reference. And also, if there are related curated genomic regions that are associated with a particular gene, it will let you know right here. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see the more detailed information. Um, again, it's organized in tabs. If you were to click on this genome view, you'd see a browser-based view of the particular region you're looking at. 
And then we sort it by the evidence for haploinsufficiency phenotype and triplosensitivity phenotype. So we'll just look at the haploinsufficiency tab for this particular gene. You'll see this first box outlines the various PubMed IDs that we've counted as evidence for this particular gene. You have a link out to the PubMed ID if you wish to look at it, and also a short description of what we felt was relevant evidence in this paper. The bottom box will contain information that may be of interest to you but may not have been a factor in the final score, such as additional phenotypic information or cases that didn't conform to official rules but are still of interest, et cetera. So do pay attention to that bottom box if there is one on the page that you're looking at. This site also contains a link to an FTP site. Um, this FTP site is updated daily, and it does include bed files that you can use in the browser of your choice. Additionally, on a quarterly basis, we take our genes and regions that have been given a score of three, either haploinsufficiency or triplosensitivity, and add it to a data set in NCBI's DB bar called ClinGen Curated Dosage Sensitivity Map, or NSTD45. You can use this information as a track in Variation Viewer at NCBI, which will be the focus of a separate webinar. Additionally, we'll use this information to begin to assess conflicts in the laboratory submitted data, which is available in DBVAR under the name NSTD37. And finally, I'd just like to point out that this is a community resource, and we encourage you to use and contribute to it. So if you are using this resource and a gene that you're interested in, you notice that, hey, it's a waiting review, and you're going to look it up anyway, then you might as well provide us with the information that you find, and we can at least get started on the entry for that particular gene. So at the side of the page, you'll see the menu that looks like this. And where the arrow is pointing to is what you would click on to report information for a particular gene. When you click on that, you'll be taken to a page that looks like this. And you can enter in your personal contact information and then whatever information that you've come across that you think would be relevant to our review of this particular gene. We'd like for you to consider doing this as part of your sign-out work. This is a really great activity for fellows, genetic counselors, et cetera, anyone that you want to really learn to critically evaluate literature. It's a great activity for them. The report does not have to be complete. You know, even if you only found one piece of information and you didn't have time to you know, do a full evaluation of it, that's still one more piece of information than we had before. So please do feel free to contribute that. And you know, if we know that we have user comments on a particular gene, we will look at that gene before another gene so it does contribute to the priority of the review. Submitting the form will generate an email directly to a ClinGen team member, and your information will be documented and reviewed in the same process as the committee submitted information. Any contributors to this resource will be acknowledged on our website. Thanks for listening today, and if you'd like to learn more about other ClinGen resources, um, we'll have the following additional webinars available through our, resource, through our website. And finally, if you have any questions on anything that you've heard today, please feel free to email us at clingen at clinicalgenome.org. Thank you.